Good day to you, my fellow 180 friends. Uh, thank you for joining us. I am so glad to have you here. Uh, man, if you did not have the chance to join us last week for 180 Briefs Live, <laughs> uh, you missed some fun, man. Uh, got to have some picnicking done. We you know, got to worship together, got to see each other's faces, uh, had some cool music going on in the background. I uh, had a good sermon by Pastor Jason, but we will be doing it again. Just not sure how soon we'll be uh, doing another 180 Brief Live. Uh, hopefully someday we'll go back to a full 180 worship service. But uh, the brief thing was kind of fun. And we got to spend a lot of time, you know, talking and stuff. For, for, you know, for, we social distance. We had the chairs uh, placed all over the sanctuary and stuff and had everybody spread out. So it was cool. Anyway, welcome to 180 Briefs. Uh, tonight's guest speaker is Pastor Elizabeth McDowell. And... I'm going to do another question thing for you. If you were hurting for money, like, I mean bad, like you have no idea how you're going to pay your bills. You're going to be losing things. You'll be, um, you know, every, all the debt collectors are coming after you. And someone overheard how much trouble you're having and they know that you're legitimately trying everything you can, you know, whether you've lost your job, you just hitting a brick wall and you find out that this person's a multi-billionaire and they want to spread the love and they offered just pay everything, not just the one huge bill that you're worried about, but they're like, just give it to me, man. Give me your bills and I will take care of it right now on the spot. Would you let them? Would you have too much pride that you couldn't because, you know, that's your responsibility? Or would you be like, oh, thank you. This must be a miracle. This must be an act of God that this person came forward and, you know, gave me this money. Let's say that your, your child is missing or some loved one if you don't have children. Uh, and... The police have been looking, neighbors have been looking, everybody's been looking, and you all cannot find your child whatsoever, and you're scared sick. And you find out that there's a guy who's an expert, you know, like his private investigator. He, like, he thrives on hunting down people and finding them and, you know, rescuing them. Would you reach out? Would you, if he offered to help, would you say yes? Or would you just totally... And I'll keep working out on my own. Many times we forget that God is just standing there with his hands wide open. And uh, he sees the troubles that we're going through. And for some reason, we keep wanting to do everything ourselves. We keep looking for other people to solve the solution. But we forget to bring it to God and, you know, in prayer and trusting him and everything. And, um... He's just, you know, he's got his hand out. Uh, years ago, I, um, if you were at 180, you saw the, the skit that I did with uh, Nick. And it's the set the scene. It's me and I'm going to go wrestle the devil. And Nick is playing God and he's walking with me as I'm getting ready to go into the fight. And we're having this dialogue where he's saying, Hey, you know, I know this guy I've, I've wrestled with him before. Do you want me to do this? I'm like, no God, I, you know, I think I've got this. I think I can uh, take down this. And, and God's like, you know, this is a devil. You shouldn't be trying to do this on your own. You know, he's got all kinds of tricks and all kinds of moves and, you know, you can't do this on your own. And I'm like, no God, I've, I've got this, you know, I'm going to go into this match and I'm going to be victorious and I'm going to do it on my own. And, you know, God's shaking his head and he's like, all right, but if you need me, just call me and I'll be there. I'm like, no, God, come on. I've got it. This, this is easy peasy, man. I'm going in. And as I come up onto the stage, my buddy Kip, who's playing the devil, he grabs me and flips me 
slams me down and, you know, pretty much locks me down and I can't get up. And God is kind of kneeling off to the side. He's like, are you sure you don't need any help? And I'm like, I've got it. And, you know, I can't move. And Kip is holding me down, uh, doing the devil bit great. And um, I get to the point where after struggling and, you know, realizing, no, I cannot do this on my own. Um, I say something to the effect like, you know, God, where it says somewhere in the Bible that, you know, cast your burdens on me and I'll pretty much take care of it. And God's like, yeah, I'm kind of familiar with the verse. And he stretches his, Nick stretches his hand out and I reach up and I tag, tag him in. And Nick, <laughs> and this was awesome to see, especially if you knew how big Nick was and how big Kip was. Uh, Nick pretty much picks up Kip, throws him practically over his shoulder, and he walks out of the chapel. And I get up, and I'm just sitting there shaking my head. And so this week, I want you to think about that. <laughs> Not so much about uh, Nick carrying Kip out of the chapel, which was pretty cool to see. But to think of the times that you've kept trying to do things yourself instead of bring it to God. And so also down in the comments, I would like you to put some things that you've struggled with and, you know, things that you're going to try letting go and letting God. So again, welcome to another episode of 180 Briefs. We are excited that you're able to join us. Uh, click on the, the like and the reminder notifications and share this with friends. Uh, we'd love to see more people coming and seeing our site. And hopefully you guys are getting a blessing from this. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, send them to 180hsdac at gmail.com. Love to hear from you guys. Love you all. Bye. Hello, Hinsdale 180 Church family. This is Pastor Elizabeth, and I am so excited to be with you this weekend as we study and worship together, either virtually or whether you're with your friends and family. We're so excited that you're here. Before we dive in too far, why don't we stop and say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you so much for being a mighty and powerful God. And Lord, as we take a moment to step aside from the busy schedules, from the lists, from the stress and anxieties of relationship or relationships or other things of this world, I ask that our hearts and minds may be laser focused on you that through this story that we are going to take a look at today, that you may empower us, that you may remind us of how good you are and how you're willing to accept us no matter how we come. In your name, amen. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I go on social media, I get a little discouraged. <laughs> in fact, a couple months ago, I took a Facebook fast where I deleted the app on Facebook, I deleted TikTok, I deleted Instagram, I deleted all my social media sites because I just wanted to get away from social media a little bit. And one of the things that I think we all too often forget in social media is that people are posting the highlights of their life. They're posting the perfect pictures, they're posting the happy moments, and all too often we don't really get to hear the sad or um, the imperfect moments of life. You know, nobody's really going on Facebook and saying, my oh my, I had a huge fight with my spouse tonight and complain about them. Now, we wouldn't want to see that on social media either, but you always see the perfect moments of people's life. You know, a couple months ago, there was this trend that started on TikTok. Now, if you don't know what TikTok is, it's a really big uh, app, social media app that is kind of like 30 second videos. <laughs> anyway, there was this trend that started on TikTok where people would show their perfect pictures that they had posted on Facebook or Instagram or other social media sites, and then they would show the uh, unedited version of it and tell the background story of the picture. So for example, there was this one that I watched and it was quite entertaining because the lady said she showed this beautiful picture of her at the beach. 
and she said, you know, it, the caption was like, girls trip at the beach or something like that. And she said, you know, in this picture, you can see I look so happy. She had a huge smile on her face. She was wearing her sunglasses. She just looked so, so excited and happy. And she said, little did everyone know that moments before this picture or moments after this picture was taken, um, I had a huge fight with my boyfriend and he broke up with me. You see, in the picture, <laughs> you would have never known that they were having a bad day, she was having a bad day, or she was fighting with her boyfriend. And who would have thought that moments after that picture was taken, her boyfriend and her would broke, break up. I mean, they had been together for like three years or something like that, so it was a pretty intense breakup. You see, what we see on social media, what we see posted online and stuff like that is usually the perfect views, uh, the perfect moments of people's life. And all too often, we really don't see the imperfect moments. And I think this is something that I've had to remind myself time and time again, because I strive to not talk about the imperfectness. I try to push that aside and be like, I'm going to do better. I'm going to work better. I'm, I want to be, I want to be perfect. I, yeah, perfect, <laughs> which sounds silly. I'm even laughing at myself because none of us are perfect. But I think all too often seeing everyone's perfect moments reminds us and allows us to forget that it's okay to have imperfect moments. You see, today we're going to take a look at a story and where it looks like it's a kind of a perfect situation, but then we start to unlayer it and we start to see some imperfectness. You see, the point of today is to remind us that in everything, in our imperfectness, in our relationship with God, we can always go to Him. Not in the perfect times, not in the moments of, uh, of, of when we have our life together, but in the imperfect moments, we can come to Him. So we're going to be taking a look at the story in Acts chapter 12. Acts is one of my favorite books of the Bible, um, and we're going to be diving in there again. Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1. For it says, About this time, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread. After they arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guards with four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out of public trial after Passover. You see, in these first few verses, in Acts chapter 12, we see that Peter is once again placed in prison. <laughs> you see, in the following, in the few chapters before this, we see that Peter is in prison multiple times, um, and it's because he is spreading the gospel, that he is sharing it to the entire world, that he, everyone he sees, he is preaching the gospel to. And so, at the beginning of chapter 12, we see that Peter once again was preaching the gospel and he was arrested and he was thrown into prison. So verse 5 is where we pick up and it says, So Peter was kept in prison, so the church was earnestly praying for him. You see, I want us to focus on this verse because it's so beautiful that Peter was once again thrown in prison and the church heard this and they said, You know what? We're going to earnestly pray for God to work a miracle. We're earnestly going to pray. I don't know if you've ever felt this urgency to pray and this intenseness to pray, but I imagine that's what the early church was doing, is they said, you know what? We need to stop everything that we're doing, and we need to come together as a community and pray to God. So that's exactly what they did. In verse 5, it says, Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. Verse 6 says, So the night Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains. Suddenly an angel of the Lord and a light shone in the cell. He, was, uh, he, was, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. He said, Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. When the angels said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap yourself in the cloak and follow me, the angel told him. 
Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea that the angel was, he had no idea what the angel was actually doing, and he thought he was in a vision. They passed by the first and second guards and came out of the iron gates, leading him out of the city. It opened them, it opened by itself, and they went through it. And when they walked the full length of the street, suddenly the angel left him. Now, I don't know about you, but I start reading this story and I'm like, wow, this looks like a scene of a movie. This looks like a perfect scenario where Peter was thrown in prison. You know, the church was earnestly praying for him and an angel of the Lord came to him and was like, all right, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to bring you out of this prison and I'm going to, um, to give you freedom. I mean, talk about a perfect scenario. And that's what we see happening here in Acts chapter 12. Now it says in verse 11, it says, Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from, Herod's, uh, from Herod and everything that the Jewish people were hoping to happen. So Peter, you know, he's out of the jail. He's on the street and he kind of has this epiphany that this really did happen. That this perfect scenario that he never thought would come true of him actually leaving prison alive <laughs> is now coming true. He's out of the jail. And so his first reaction, which is a beautiful thing to see, is that he decides to go back to his people. He decides to go back to his community and tell him, tell them what he has seen and what he has experienced. And so in verse 12, it says, when his hand, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also Mark, and many people were gathered there praying. Now, again, in verse 5, we saw that the church was earnestly praying for Peter. You see, they knew he was in jail, and so they were earnestly praying for him. They were doing what everyone was expected to do, right? They were doing what they knew how to do. So they were praying this prayer for Peter. Now, I don't exactly know what they were praying for, but I imagine that they were praying that Peter would come out of jail safe and that he would be released. And so he, I want us to keep in mind this story is that the church is earnestly praying and that Peter is released now by an angel and he goes to the house. And in verse 13, it says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl came to the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Now, I really think that this is a movie scene in itself. You see where you knock on the door and somebody's so excited to see you that they run back without even like opening the door or anything. You're just stood standing there like, uh, are you going to let me in? And that's exactly what happens here. She's so excited that she sees Peter that she doesn't even open the door for him, that she runs back to the rest of the people who are earnestly praying and says, Peter is at the door. Now, you would think that the people who were at the house earnestly praying for Peter would be enthusiastic that he was at the door. But you see in verse 15, the people who are earnestly praying say, are you out of your mind? They told her when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be an angel. But Peter kept knocking. <laughs> He and when the door opened and they saw him, they were astonished. Peter mentioned with a motion with his hand uh, for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Now, I just want to stop here. And this is where actually we're going to stop the story. But I want us to realize that one, the early church was praying earnestly for Peter and then when a miracle did happen, they were astonished that it did. You see, this is the point where I'm trying to make today, is that we sometimes strive to do the perfect thing. And the perfect thing in our Christian mindset sometimes is to pray when something has gone wrong. But the thing that we don't do all too often is we have faith in the prayer that we're praying. You see, faith is required not only in the act of prayer, but the aftermath of prayer. 
Meaning that if you don't have faith in the thing that you're praying about, what's the point of praying? And I don't mean to say that in a bad way. <laughs> um, of course, I want all of us to pray. I want to pray. But I think it's so important that when we do pray, we're praying because we trust God. We're praying a meaningful prayer. We're praying that God and trusting that God will hear our prayer and will act accordingly. You know, you know, I think all too often our prayers are the size of our faith instead of our prayer being the size of our creator. I'm going to say that one more time. I think all too often our prayers are the size of our faith instead of the size of our creator. Meaning that I can have really little faith, <laughs> that I can be praying something, that I can pray anything. <laughs> But if I pray with the size of faith that I have, which is not as big as anything in this world, instead of praying to and praying big prayers and having big faith in the one who is created, prayer just isn't the same. You know, I found myself praying these these prayers such as I see in Acts chapter 12, praying the prayers of saying, God, I know you can do this. I know that you can work a miracle here. But I think the key and the point that I want to make here in Acts chapter 12 is that all too often we pray these prayers of saying, God, I know you can work a miracle. I know you can save my relationship. I know you can put food on our table. I know you can do all of these things. But as we pray them, sometimes our heart and mind doubts them. And that's where I'm talking about this faith, this big faith requirement, is that when we come to him, we're earnestly praying, such as the people in the early church did in Acts 12, but are we earnestly having faith in what we are praying for? Are we having faith in our creator, or are we having faith in these realities of our world? <laughs> are we coming to God with a big mindset because he is a big God, are we coming to God with our small faith mindset of what the world has told us can and cannot happen? You know, these are just my thoughts today. <laughs> these are just the things that have been on heavy on my heart. And I hope that today as you um, talk with God, as you study with God, that you may say a prayer of big faith, that you may continue to come to him in your imperfectness <laughs> um, and your uh, faults and be able to come to him and say, God, I know that sometimes I've doubted you, even though I've earnestly prayed. Sometimes I've questioned you, even when I'm steady, fast in prayer. But Lord, I come to you with a big faith, a faith in which I can trust you, a faith in which I just want you to be completely in charge. So I thank you so much for being here with us today, and I hope that you are blessed and that we can continue to be a community of believers, not only earnestly praying, but earnestly having trust in him. Bye, church family.